Okay, five, four. And we are back with another episode of Talking Kotlin. It's nice to see uh, things back the way they used to be, right, Hadi? With you doing the countdown, it's much easier. Yeah, it is. And I got to remember not to crouch. I always end up crouching, and then I'm not at the same level as you, Seb. So well, you have a you have a height adjustable that. desk, right? So you can just you know like. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> but I crouch on the desk, so if the desk goes down, so does my crouching. Oh, anyway, how I have you been? It's it's uh it's January, right? We're recording this in January. That's right. January first, 16th, 17th. First episode of 2023. Yeah. Yep, it so is. Um, start then. starting out uh, strong. Yeah, no, I've been I've been great. I've gotten my relaxation in after the advent of code uh end of last year. Um and now I'm, you know, re-energized. I'm starting to drink caffeine again, so re-caffeinated. Um, you know, bouncing off the walls and ready to go. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I tried the advent of code for a couple of minutes and then decided that <laughs> I'm nearly going to be 50 and I, I should move on with my life. Uh, but anyway, so who are our guests today? Yeah, uh, today we have uh, Zach, Kieran and Amrita from uh, Slack. Hi, welcome to the show, everyone. Hello. Hello. Hey, uh, really good to have all of you here. Uh, I'm super excited about uh, today's topic, uh, because we're going to be talking about something called circuit. Um, but before we kind of dive into all of this, uh, let's make sure that our audience knows uh, who you are and what your credentials are for being on here, right? Uh, so let's just quickly go around and, and maybe do a quick round starting uh, maybe with Amrita. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Amrita. Um, I'm living in San Francisco, California right now. Um, and I've been working at Slack for about two and a half years. Um, I was an intern on the Android infrastructure team back in 2019. And then I returned full time. Um, and I've been working with Zach and Kieran very closely um, on a bunch of things. So yeah, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. All right. And then next, Kieran. Hi there, uh, my name is Kieran. I'm uh, based in Toronto. I've been at Slack for about two and a half years, um, working in Android for about uh, eight, eight to 10 years or so. Um, I originally joined on a feature team at Slack before switching, uh, transferring to the infrastructure team about six, eight months ago to work with Zach and Amrita. Excited to be here, thank you. Wonderful, and then uh, a repeat offender, I guess, at this point, Zach. <laughs> Hi, I'm Zach Swears. I'm based in New York City. Um, I've been at Slack for a little over three years now, um, kind of ping-ponging around between uh, infrastructure and developer experience. And uh, yeah, excited to, to tell you all a bit more about Circuit. I, I think this is maybe the first time on Talking Kotlin where the number of Android developers make like the majority <laughs> of, the, uh, of the chat. Because usually uh, both Hadi and I, not being big uh, Android folks, kind of uh, put that's a damper on that. That's not true. No, that's not true. No. No? I, uh, I had two weeks vacation and I wrote an Android application. Okay, wonderful. Then so how do you you take us you take us in? An and, yeah, now you take us into well, the topic. Then I mean, you were asking what are your credentials for being on this show, and <laughs> I, I'm sharing mine. Right, I wrote an oh, Android application. Oh, right, yeah. yeah so yeah. Anyway, anyway. Point. what? It's on his LinkedIn at this point. Verified. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I mean, I won't, right? I, won't, I won't. I won't mention the fact that it was a sample from the tutorial, but you know, anything counts, right? That's right. um, and uh, my next step is to up upload it, upload it, update it to use Compose. And and talking about Compose, that's what we're going to talk about today, right? Because your framework, your stuff that we're going to talk about today is called Circuit. So can you give us an uh, elevator pitch on what <laughs> Circuit is? <laughs> that was not a pun. <laughs> yeah, so Circuit is a... Um... Compose-based um, architecture for, uh, I will say, just Android applications, but like Kotlin applications in general. Uh, since Compose itself uh, has a multi-platform offering, that's actually something we've been using sort of out the gate with this, which has been uh, pretty fun. Obviously, our primary focus is Android, um, but it's, uh, yeah, basically we, um, at Slack, our architecture kind of hadn't changed 
uh, too much over the past few years. And there was a lot of things in the wider community that we wanted to adopt or felt like we were sort of having to otherwise um, wedge in to our existing architecture. So things like uh, coroutines, compose, <clears throat> um, newer patterns like unidirectional data flow. Um, and so for years, we had sort of other projects where we would try to modernize different parts of the code base, but we always kind of said like, okay, our baseline is we're not touching architecture. We're going to do everything else because something needs to stay constant. Um, and then eventually we got to the point where it was just like, okay, we got to, we got to do the architecture. And, um, yeah, we, we wanted to try to bring the code base from somewhere around 2016 to 2022. And, um, I think that for the most part, we achieved that. Um, and with Circuit, we kind of took some um, ambitious steps towards like not just using Compose in UI, which I think going out the gate, we were like, this is obviously something we want to do in the UI layer, but then also using Compose's sort of powerful state management APIs um, at the actual like presenter, reducer, you know, whatever you want to call that layer level um, has turned out really well. I think this is, uh, of course, this is kind of the, the the classic part here because you, I'm I'm also looking at the uh, at the readme or, or the the overview page of Circuit, um, where you say that it's it's composed from the ground up, which uh, for me immediately uh, my mind went to this the, the the classic discussion of naming, right? Where uh, when people say compose, you have on the one side the the compose UI, and then on the other hand, the, just the the compose compiler itself. Um, right, which kind of has has this idea of that there's maybe more to compose than just being able to use it for um, for different components. So this is kind of where uh, where Circuit like fits in, where it it kind of brings it further down the the stack. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Um, the what we need are like lints in there to make sure that people don't actually try to do compose UI in the presenters. Um, <laughs> so technically you could do it. I don't know what would happen, but um, yeah, it's uh, we wanted to try to push it uh, to a lower layer. Um, Jake Warden has a great blog post about this whole like compose by another name. I think is the title of it where it's basically like, Hey, like it should really be, two libraries because like one's the UI part and one's the runtime and the runtime actually doesn't know anything about UI. It's just a thing for like trees and state management. Um, but yeah, we kind of like took that and ran with it. Yeah. Kieran, you wanted to say something before Zach rudely interrupted you again. <laughs> no, I was just, I was going to agree with him. Uh, I, I think I, he was talking about, you know, bringing us into 2022 and I was thinking we were maybe even moving into leading the way rather than following with um, using Compose more than for than just UI. Um, but he, he kind of alluded to that. So I'm nodding in agreement. So talking about um, Jake, uh, you, you have a reference that this is heavily influenced by Cash App's Broadway architecture. Can you kind of like uh, tell us what that is for the for the listeners and and how it's influenced and maybe why then use this instead of that uh i can try i haven't uh let me think now so we um they're, they're doing something similar as i recall um in that they're using they're, they're trying to use compose as well in in um in their presenters and they've got a couple of tools namely does this molecule fit in in under the broadway category zach i can't remember yeah i think so yeah so so they're doing something similar in that they've created a um an open source library called molecule that allows them to kind of stand up a composable environment that they can allows them to use compose in their presenters and um doing something similar to what we are they're just not using compose directly, I guess, they're kind of using it through their molecule framework is my, my understanding. Um, I know, is there any, I, that's, that's not a great description, Zach, is there anything I'm missing here? Uh, yeah, I guess the larger context is like, at the same time that we were prototyping with different um, frameworks and also seeing what it would look like if we did something custom and in-house, um, we were talking a lot with um, folks from Cash App and uh, sort of like knowledge sharing from um, stuff that they were already doing. 
Um, and we kind of ended up borrowing quite a bit from those discussions to the point where when um, one of them, uh, Benoit, I don't remember how to pronounce his last name, I'm sorry, uh, gave a talk at Droycon New York about their architecture, like detailing how Broadway works. Um, a lot of it um, is like, you can basically kind of like squint at circuit and see it as almost like an implementation of like a lot of the concepts that they, they describe in that talk. Um, we learned a, a ton from them in uh, our conversations during all this. We also talked with uh, um, a couple of other people on like the Compose team over at Google, basically, you know, trying to build this, but recognizing that like, we don't need to like live in a vacuum. Um, there's a lot of like good ideas and things that people have already done out there. Um, Broadway is by far like the biggest influence on this. Um, yeah, it's a it's a great talk. It's from Joycon New York. Um, highly recommend it. Yeah, so I think we can also add that one to the show notes. Otherwise, I believe you even have that one linked again also on the uh, on the readme or on the overview page for Circuit. Um, and of course, for, for those of you who haven't actually uh, seen that episode yet, uh, we actually sat down with uh, with Jake Wharton and Saket Narayan uh, on Compose and Cash App, where uh, they were also talking a little bit about uh, molecules. So if you want to get a little bit of background knowledge on that, uh, you can, of course, uh, tune into that one. But so... Just, but just for 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 context for me, where where I can kind of place this in my head, um, th would you say that that molecule and then circuit kind of try to hit the same niche, or is is one trying to be kind of a superset of features of the other? Do they complement each other? Like where where do they how do they fit together as a puzzle? Um, I don't know, Zach. Uh, the difference. I mean, we're both trying to solve, I think, a similar problem, and that. We're trying to enable the use of Compose in your at your business logic layer. Um, we just go about, I guess, both projects can kind of go about it in a different way. We are directly annotating our method, our, our presenter method, with with Composable, so that the runtime just um, is able to um, run, I guess, in that method directly. Ours uh, with with Molecule, they're kind of my understanding is extending or building upon Compose to build a infrastructure or library that your presenter um, code will call does that does that make does that ring true zach yeah it's uh they're they're not exactly like trying to solve the same thing um like we use molecule in uh circuit for testing um because it lets us stand up a compose environment in like a jvm only setup really easily um and it you can think of molecule as more of like a um like a batteries included sort of like way of bootstrapping compose in different environments. Um, in Android, like the equivalent is uh, there will be like an compose view that sits in your view hierarchy somewhere. And then that under the hood, like then goes in and provides everything that Android's framework itself offers. And they have like 800 different composition locals for getting a different um, like common services. Um, Molecule basically tries to like replicate that, but with, um, you know, basically no, no sort of like provided uh, composition locals uh, coming with it and in a way that's very easy to like use in tests. So they're not like mutually exclusive. Um, I think uh, the bigger thing with Broadway is that they, um, they have sort of like three different iterations of their architecture with like, there's an Rx Java version because that's what they use sort of ubiquitously. And then there's um, like a coroutines flow version. Um, and then finally there's a molecule version that lets you do all of your presenter logic in uh, Compose. And then they can interrupt between any of those three uh, different implementations really easily. Um, that's something that we kind of didn't need to have to support. So that's why we were able to just sort of like go the whole nine yards and just use Compose like natively on the presenters and not need to uh, worry about um, trying to interrupt back to uh, other. Well, we do have interrupt support for like certain things uh, in Slack, but not trying to have something that is like, um, we didn't have to go as far as uh, they have. 
so so circuit is is really more kind of the it's it's the holistic way of then then also architecting your your application and kind of trying to uh trying to apply all of these things rather than just like be a be an individual component would that be legit to say amrita you um put in some yeah. words yeah i was gonna say um in response to that like we've tried doing some sort of interop or we've tried having doing like patchwork like we're going to do these things in or we're going to do certain new features in compose or we're going to do certain new i guess like async stuff in coroutines and then we wanted circuit to just be a way that because it's both compose and coroutine first it was something that you know it we like all our components that we now used to be in xml are now you know just completely in compose and we wanted that going forward for every single component that we make. And I think, I mean, I think it makes it faster to prototype new things um, in, in this new architecture, um, just because spinning up a preview and compose is much faster. You're able to sort of prototype things and look at the, look at how things look faster before it was much slower and you just have to build it over and over again. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the compose and coroutine first is a huge, jump from where we were when we were just trying to do some sort of interop and again like patchwork try and fix things and make them more modernized than what they were before so, so go ahead go ahead Seb. no i already every single time yeah <laughs> it's like you sink my souls with me go no that's you i'm not saying a word now i'm just remaining silent go okay <laughs> so uh so. how <laughs> I'm sure no, this bit is. No. I'm sure this bit is actually not gonna stay in the episode. We'll see. I bloody hell, um, hope it does. But if no. it is, if it is, say something in the comments. I don't know. Uh, I was. I was just gonna ask, like, whether this was something that then was kind of initially born out of like the frustration plus like the um, the excitement about something new, or whether that was just kind of an opportunity that 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 came along. Like, what what sparked all of this initially, maybe. I think it was a, it was probably a bit of both. Um, I we had we had an initiative earlier at Slack where we were trying to just look at you know what we can modernize in the code base, and we had I mean we you've been using MVP for a while, but at some point we realized okay there are limitations here, um, and we wanted to go forward and adopt the new libraries that you know that. Google was pushing. Um, and there will be a point where, you know, they will stop supporting XML and Compose will be the only UI library that they support going forward. So this was kind of an initiative to be like, okay, we're leaving whatever our app that are, was made in 2016 or or where it was in 26, we're leaving that behind. And we're now trying to build new features or at least prototype new things in Circuit so that we have an idea at least like performance-wise, testing-wise, you know, what would a coroutine compose first app look like? Um, and I think so far, like the, it's been, we've gotten really good feedback. Um, a lot of the feature teams that have adopted compose or have adopted circuit have really enjoyed it. Um, it's not just like easy to pick up in, I mean, in terms of ease, uh, the understanding of compose and understanding of coroutines is probably like what is the barrier to entry, if that makes sense. Um, knowing those two things well, obviously helps you adopt circuit faster, but we've gotten feedback that it's not just, you know, easy somewhat to use, but that it is also fun to use, which I think is really important. That is actually really cool. I think I think we're gonna put that one on the thumbnail. It's just gonna be, it's <laughs> it's fun to use. That's always that's a that's a good tagline. As as someone who is uh who's always looking for the fun in programming, that actually sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. I think the the big sort of like uh impetus for this uh, was sort of uh, so the project that Emrita referenced that we did in the past was this thing called Duplo, where we kind of, it was broken down in like three different things of like, uh, we have a few blog posts about it as well in our end blog, but the like TLDR of it is we like heavily modularized the code base and we picked a bunch of specific areas to modernize. Um, and when we came out on the other side of that, uh, it became very apparent that we didn't have like a um, a unified story for how these things all like work together. Um, so we had a bunch of like, you know, hey, like we use this like MVP architecture that is like a snapshot of 2016 best practices. 
And uh, we, you know, we are open to using coroutines and we don't have a great hook for how they work with that architecture, but here's some ideas of what you could try. And then for like Compose, you're like, well, you can put it in a fragment and fragments work with MVP. We don't really know what separation and concerns look like in that case, but we, uh, you know, it's not impossible to do. Um, if you want to do like uh, unidirectional data flow, we had this thing called UI state manager that sort of one of the things that we did in that modernization project was we removed auto, the event bus library, and then we added UI state manager, uh, which acted as an event bus. So we uh, basically brought it back. <laughs> and um, yeah, and what, what we were clearly missing at that point was like uh, how uh, how do all these fit together and like, what's like the, the bigger story. And we realized we needed to, to write that story, I guess. Um, yeah, we had a bunch of things that could basically like, they all worked independently, but there's no cohesion for, um, using them together. So I, I have, I have one, one question then yet, because I'm still kind of trying to, to, to wrap my round about, about the, the thing as a whole, because you, you mentioned that it, that it builds on like some, some core principles, right? Like, uh, presenters. So you have something where you are querying the model, you're updating the view, you have, um, unidirectional data flow UDF, as you said a couple of times. So you have the application state flowing towards the UI and you have the events flowing from the UI back to your, to, to influence your application state. Um, but I mean, so these are exactly, you got the little, little loop loop going. Exactly. <laughs> um, so, so would you just say that this is kind of like the, these are the defining parts of, of like a, the circuit architecture then, or, or is there anything on top of that, that makes uh, that makes circuits special that others that do this, this kind of circular architecture, uh, that they maybe don't do. Yeah. So the, um, you know, the gist of that is sort of standard UDF, um, circuit does a bunch of extra things on top of that, that is heavily inspired by our sort of advanced use of, uh, dagger and anvil. Um, and also like we kind of use the very standard square, uh, stack of a few different things from like, okay, CTP and retrofit and Mashi that, um, lean very heavily into this factory pattern, um, that lets you sort of, uh, compose, uh, behavior on top of things really nicely. So you can have like, say like forwarding presenters that like wrap other ones, and decorate them for a different behavior, um, sort of everything in circuit itself is a factory first and then we um just have like these ui and presenter factories that then given a screen key will give you these real instances and that i think is probably the like low key like most powerful part of circuit because uh and we kind of run into this all the time when we are trying to sort of like build out support for <clears throat> a custom use case inside of slack we're like oh how do we expose this or like where where does this fit in and like every time we kind of run into that we're able to usually just kind of fall back to like doing like a you know delegating a presenter that then exposes some maybe composition local for doing tracing um or for like navigation if you want to be able to navigate out of circuit into say uh starting a standard uh activity in android um but circuit only speaks like screens we have like an intercepting navigator that will look for a special screen type that contains an intent. And then um, it keeps the like bones of the framework really simple. Um, but that sort of like, I, know, I guess, interception or interceptor mechanism, I think is really, yeah, it's been really powerful for us already. I think some of the other stuff that we've built along the way as sort of like batteries included um, have been really helpful for this and they're also not necessarily even like specific to circuit so things like um we built a so like in compose you have like remember for like within the same composition uh remembering values and then you have remember savable which is sort of the like remembering things across uh the back stack or process death um but there was never something for remembering say in like a configuration change in android so when it rotates um, and so we built something called like circuit, uh, retained, which lets you do like, remember retained, um, that lets you retain information, uh, without having to 
stuff your whole presenter into say like a view model on Android, which is sort of the historically canonical way of doing this um, and something that uh, I think Google is going to try to make less required. Um, some other things for like handling like overlays, um, we've got some uh, nice APIs for that. Um, and our like navigation is sort of like dead simple in like a way that I think is uh, hopefully going to be refreshing for anyone that tries it. Um, it's not too complicated. It's literally just a push and pop method and under the hood, it's a list. <laughs> and like, we, um, Ray Ryan gave a really good talk also at Joycon New York talking about navigation where he has a comment in there somewhere that like we kind of give navigation too much uh, attention when it should really just be simpler. Um, and we've been pretty happy with how this has uh, ended up uh, for us so far. So in the category of design patterns, uh, what would you say that this resembles? Is it is it an MVP? Is it an MVI? Where does it sit more close to? MVI, for sure. We use Presenter in uh, the name of it, uh, but, you know, I don't know, you can kind of call it whatever you want. <laughs> but uh, MVI is definitely, like, uh, functionally what it most resembles. Doesn't anyone struggle with that, with the idea that you call a, a, a an entity a presenter and and yet it's got nothing to do with MVP? We went with that because that's what we use internally at Slack. So it makes sense to all of those users. So it's it's hist it's historically grown, like uh, you yeah. know, like those what was it, the SAP systems out there that where if you use them in the United States, they they got some fourteen character German name because that's what made sense for the original users. Maybe not quite as extreme. I, I'm I'm sure people are gonna uh, gonna be able to to work with with that just fine. But it it really so so kind of with with you expanding on all of this and and also working with things like the um, like being able to uh, survive anything from from process death to configuration changes. It really does sound like it's it's a more holistic approach of just like how you would then uh, architect your your application. Uh, is 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 that also like safe to say? Yeah, I think um, the or Zach mentioned this briefly, but the screens, the way that we use screens in Circuit as kind of a key between presenters and UIs, it on it kind of automatically connects the presenter and UI, and that's kind of what makes the the whole circuit. Um, and the screen can contain information, pass information in between. So I think in terms of ease of use and kind of understanding the concept as a whole, the screen ties the presenters and UIs together, which I think is important um, in this architecture going forward. Right. So um, as you know, uh, Seb is not an Android developer. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I am. Uh, but, uh, Great. Now I'm the odd one out. <laughs> oh, my. I am one of you. Uh, but for me, it was uh, obviously very exciting to hear about this is multi-platform. So uh, tell us more about that. Like, um, yeah, is it? How supported is it across different platforms and, and what are the uh, possibilities of using this in desktop applications, for instance? The work's been done to uh, keep as much of the, um, you know, the bones and the infrastructure, I guess, um, kind of in, you know, constructed in a multi-platform type way so that you can, you know, you can use it to build command line app, desktop app, whatever you like. Um, we are leveraging Jetpack comp or uh, JetBrains Compose, right? Um, We've even got a couple of sample apps that that kind of demonstrate how you can use it for these other purposes. Um, a couple of the things that that Zach had mentioned around retaining state, you know, are specific obviously to Android, but they're not something. They're in different different packages, different modules, so they're not something that you would need um, if you were going to build, say, a desktop application. But I, I don't think there's any reason or any anything stopping someone from from building a circuit application for for a desktop application. Yeah, there's some parts that are not fully implemented and it's not necessarily because uh they can't be as much as they are just things that we haven't really like gotten to as sort of high priority for us um we've gotten a, a pr or two from um folks in the community to try to um push more code toward uh basically our common source sets um in places where um where we can but yeah, right now, the main focus has just been Android. Um, and 
with that, we kind of get JVM uh, slash like composed desktop more or less for free since that is actually sort of pretty well uh, supported and built out by um, the JetBrains Compose. Um, what What's the right way to refer to that project, by the way, while, while we have you here? <laughs> Hadi, do you want to say? I usually just refer to it as Compose Multiplatform or yeah, Compose, compose for multi Desktop. Platform. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Compose Multiplatform. Um, yeah, like we haven't... Uh, we haven't tried to do anything on, say, like iOS, um, and uh, somewhere our iOS info team just sends a disturbance in the force. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it was never like the multi-platform part of it was something that we sort of saw an opportunity to um, design for it early on, um, but it was never one of the like original like goals of the architecture as much as a sort of like something that we realized we could do along the way. Um, we do actually have um, one composed desktop uh, app using this internally, um, just like a little internal tool for generating new projects. Um, yeah, I think realistically, that's probably where the most potential is for like other platforms. Um, I, I don't think that there will be much iOS interest in this for the same reason that there's not much iOS interest in anything other than you know, native uh, frameworks in general. Oh, we'll change that. We will change that. I, um, yeah, I wish you good luck. Thanks for the wise words. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the support there, Zach. Uh, <laughs> it has been uh, sort of fun, I think, especially, um, and uh, Kira and Emrita should speak on more on this, but like, I think that a lot of people, like, they don't get really good opportunities to try out multi-platform. Um, and a lot of that boils down to, like, things that they are familiar with are not available in, um, you know, multi-platform world. And so hopefully, like, uh, if you, like, you know, like using Circuit and you want to build some UI with that, like, you don't feel like you need to uh, sort of completely start from scratch versus like being able to work with things you know. I think it is actually a really uh, cool step from from all of you folks then just kind of saying we're we're gonna take the uh, because I mean I think by by the time like Com Compose came out it was all very fresh very new everyone had new things to learn the APIs were changing quite quickly uh, then Compose multi platform came along which added like one more layer on uh, like the shaky tower um, like at least in the beginning uh, so it's I think especially cool that you decided to kind of go go in this direction and say, hey, if people do want to run their, their projects on uh, on the JVM, uh, like who are we to stand in their way? We're going to uh, we're going to take a little bit of that that extra complication uh, towards us uh, and and kind of future proof um, the, the the circuit library. So I'm just I'm just very excited about that. Just a little side note. <laughs> yeah, I think like, Android developers, a lot of times whenever they want to try something multi-platform, uh, even if they want to use uh, Compose multi-platform, then they start looking around like, where's my business logic? I guess I can only do UI in a multi-platform way. Maybe there's a multi-platform fragments. Uh, again, entire Android world just sends a disturbance in the force. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's, been, uh, it's been fun doing that out of the gate. Um, and it's sort of, uh, I guess in some ways, been like a good sort of like challenge. Um, we do get one sort of big benefit out of it that um, we're not leveraging as much as I think we would like yet inside the actual Slack code base with like our integration of Circuit, but um, it's definitely something that we had an eye on uh, when we started doing multi-platform, and that's being able to do uh, pure JVM tests for um, actual like uh, Circuit business logic, um, which. And that's where we also then use Molecule as well. Um, and, you know, just in general, like, I don't think it's like a, a secret that like a pure JVM Kotlin project um, is just usually a lot faster and uh, lower weight on your build system than IDE than uh, a full blown Android project. Um, it also obviously runs a lot faster to be able to do tests in a you know local JVM rather than needing to do things on device. Um, so that's one thing that we're really excited about that uh, Compose multi-platform offers because 
you know, it's multi-platform, not just for the UI part, but also the runtime. And that means we can run these, you know, presenters in a, uh, in an easy way in just regular JVM tests. Kieran, I, I noticed you were you were nodding along, especially intensely when uh, when Zach brought up uh, the the usage in the in the Slack uh, code base. Do you want to expand on that one, maybe for us? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, I've been working very closely with a number of uh, the feature teams as they are exploring Compose and um, and Circuit in particular. And uh, yeah, we. You know, I'm kind of building on some of what we said. We see a lot of value in it, and a lot of the teams that we're working with are really excited about it as well. Um, you know, specifically to you know improve maintainability and testability, that, that sort of thing, right? Um, so yeah, I was just nodding along because he was, you know, he was uh, kind of alluding to a lot of the work that I've been doing most recently, I guess, just in supporting the rollout of Circuit internally. So here's actually been like the probably the like biggest. Uh voice on the actual like testing side of circuit. I don't know if you want to maybe like, we kind of feel like haven't explained much about like how like circuit is to use. Um, and the testability is actually, I think probably low key, like one of the best parts. Uh, do you want to maybe like explain what that looks like here? Yeah, sure. So uh, yeah, that's good that you brought that up. Um, yeah, so like a, a couple of things that we get from Compose that we, we can't, can't complain or can't claim Having innovated on was the you know the uni unidirectional data flow and um, just the way I guess Compose itself works right you just you, you've got a state object you pass into your composable and that makes testing our, our UI really easy so already out of the gate of using Compose you're you're getting some I think improved testability uh, at least the way that we were doing it historically um, Zach kind of a, mentioned that we we're you know we're using Molecule as well in our presenters in our presenter tests I should say sorry. And that makes testing our presenters really, really easy. Um, in the past, we were, we were doing MVP with a contract, so there's maybe you know X number of methods that we need to that the the presenter might call on the view. So we're you know we want to try and exercise that and the logic um, that calls those methods, which could make some 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 of your tests really big and complex. Um, using uh, a kind of a composable presenter, you've got one one method and one emission, one state emission, and we use Molecule to make that possible. So, um, you know, you you have your input state coming through your screen object, and then you can test your single output object to make sure it's what you expect. Um, you can um, simulate clicks or, or user interaction via your um, what we call the event sync, which is how we get events back from the, the UI to the, the presenter. And then verify that your singular single output state is what you expect. So it makes the testing loop really, really simple. Uh, now you're just testing the various different types of states, um, and it becomes really clean and, and easy. You don't, you know, in in the past we struggled with some really big presenter methods and pr huge presenter tests. Uh, now with Circuit, we're seeing a lot smaller, more you know, kind of tight tight uh, presenters and therefore tighter tests that are really easy to kind of pick up later and understand. Um, so I think we're going to see, as we continue to adopt circuit, we're going to see a lot of, um, you know, a lot of more benefit there as well going forward. So we're re really excited about that. It sounds to me like you're, uh, so essentially that circuit kind of helps you turn parts of your application more into like pure functions, almost like where, where you're much more dependent on just whatever your input is determines your output makes it more testable. And then likewise, whatever your event is determines your new state. Uh, so that also makes it probably easier. Is that right? Yeah, I think, yes, that, I think that's accurate. I mean, I, our methods are never likely going to be pure in that we, we're still using objects in most cases with, you know, we're rejecting dependencies. But yeah, I mean, you it, it definitely gets us more along that line, I think, to the the functional side of things where it's what, what are your inputs and here's the expected output, right? And it's a single thing you have to test, which makes it a lot easier, I think, personally. So talking about adoption, you mentioned adoption at Slack. How how much of uh, Circuit is being used in Slack and is it used in any way in the actual uh, product? I, I can speak a bit to that. Uh, we're still pretty early days. We've um, we just had our kind of first milestone um, just before the holiday break, you know, late it was early, early to late November. I can't remember when exactly. Um, right away, we had feature teams jump on it and start using it uh, for some internal things. Uh, we've got a bunch of debug screens internally that have been converted. A uh, whole bunch of debug screens that are using Circuit now. Um, but I believe we've got a couple of small features that are now Circuit. Um, 
Uh, Emery, does that, can you think of any uh, anything else that I might have missed there? I, it, it's still early, fairly early days. I don't know if these are out in, in prod yet, but I know um, some, there was like a, a background feature for huddles um, that was created in circuit. Um, I remember we had a, a hack day right before the holidays as well. And um, well, uh, one person on one of the feature teams used circuit for um, like, I think creating custom emojis on Android or something like that. Um, and I, what's, what's awesome is that that hack day, I think was two or three days and he was able to, you know, spin, spin it up using circuit in two or three days without ever, ever having used circuit before. Um, those are the two I can remember off the top of my head. Um, Zach. Yeah. The, the color picker is, uh, so like whenever you do like huddles on mobile app, um, it's for, it's like a color picker for picking your background color or something. You know, it's a pretty like simple one, but they wanted to kind of like get their foot in the door with it. Um, that team in particular, um, well, I, there's there's been like two or three teams we've been working with that have all been great, but that team in particular was like really well suited to jumping into the circuit because they had been doing uh, Compose with UDF um, already in their um, their features. So like kind of like wrapping all that up into circuit was actually really uh, simple for them to, to move over to. Um, that uh, line that uh, someone mentioned earlier about uh, it being fun to use was more or less a direct quote taken from like the engineer on that team that uh, did the initial testing with it. Um, yeah, the uh, the other big team that we've had uh, working with us uh, on it since the early days is um, internally they're called the platform team, but this is the team that does all of the like um, basically block kit, which is whenever say like whenever you send a message and you can do like a poll in the message and it has buttons in the message and all that in Slack, like they're the team behind all of that. And they are very excited for Compose because they're, they kind of have to build sort of these like, I don't know, not server driven layouts, but like not terribly far away from it either. Cause like server sends them down basically something that's like, Hey, like the message looks like this. And like, it's got a, you know, a drop down link and like multiple options and a button and this and that. And it's like, we have to make all of that, work and it's really like yeah it's a lot um and they are so yeah they were really excited for compose they're really excited for uh something like circuit to make it easy for them to get their foot in the door i think there's still as far as things are in production it's still just a few sort of like one-offs uh where like it opens up into circuit and you can like input some like data in it and then it comes back so it's sort of those like ephemeral um you know every actually i think uh Kira was telling me this last week, like everyone wants to put stuff into a bottom sheet and come back. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, everyone wants to. <laughs> Circuit is really good for bottom sheet and user input. Um, yeah. <laughs> is that is that the big internal pitch? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, all these teams are no none of them have done compose either, so they're like, what is the least scary place to stuff? Try and do this for the first time, right? And it's some ill you know poorly used bottom sheet somewhere it seems to be what what gets picked so yeah i was gonna ask that because it's by the, by the sounds of it 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 feels like it's quite easy to integrate into existing code bases right by by what you're saying but uh, how much knowledge do folks need to have of compose or are these teams actually adopting this without really knowing compose yeah that's been i <clears throat> that's been the biggest challenge is that a lot of these teams are coming um, they're interested in using Circuit and they're excited to use Compose and they know nothing about either of them. So the biggest learning curve up front seems to be um, Compose. And then, um, then it's like, well, this is how we've done it you know, historically at Slack uh, and they try to do it that way and it doesn't work in a Compose world. So it's, you know, um, just everything is different in the Compose world, right? So it's, it's, it's once they kind of wrap their head around Compose and how that works, um, you know, recomposition happens, that sort of thing then adding figuring out circuit is is pretty straightforward at that point um but compose seems to be the biggest hurdle for, for teams um we also have a design system already in place called slack kit um which you know has its own theming colors all of that and that and we that has been a big initiative in the past couple of years um for just to convert you know as many things as possible to our slack kit design design system so that everything is consistent um, and now that we're migrating to Compose and we're no longer using XML, that we're trying to kind of move off of, or we're, we're trying to keep that Slack kit uh, consistency, but, you know, create these same 
uh, components in Compose. And that can also be a challenge um, is, you know, making sure that we're keeping everything the same as well as, you know, not regressing in, in terms of what we're, we're making new. We are definitely taking a bit of a big leap with, because um, it's going from basically like Rx MVP to like Compose based UDF um, and like coroutines as well. Hi. Um, <laughs> and sort of all in one go. And so there's a lot of ground that uh, people have to cover if they want to, you know, sort of jump all the way through. Um, one really great thing with Compose is that it does have this sort of fantastic um, interop with uh, common uh, libraries like RxJava and um, coroutines. And that makes it really easy for teams to sort of, you know, you can maybe like, start with circuit just for maybe like your UI uh, portion. And then most of your presenter logic may actually end up still sort of like delegating to um, implementation de details that you've written uh, prior to that. And you can kind of move things over more incrementally. Um, it is sort of like, there's a bit of like an art to it because you don't want to, um, yeah, after like interop to a certain extent is really helpful, but if, you kind of like are constantly interrupting back and forth, and then you can end up actually with sort of more complicated code than than you wanted. Also, obviously, like testability, kind of we lose a lot of the benefits that Kira was talking about before. If you're uh, still writing business logic um, in sort of your your old presenter style, um, I did before we get. I know we're kind of too far away from it now, but before we get even farther away from the testing conversation, uh, I was gonna. Uh, ask Amrita if you want to talk a little bit about what the UI testing side of that looks like. Um, I know that, yeah, it's it's been a lot better for UI testing, especially because our UI testing has been sometimes very inconsistent. Uh, it has been inconsistent prior to what we've been doing with um, Circuit. Yeah, Kieran, do you, do you mind speaking a little bit about that? Sure, yeah. So um, Paparazzi is another thing that, another library that's Square the Square or Cash App team has been building. And um, I guess there was there was a lot of interest, I think, at Slack at using it. We um, There were a couple of really good talks at, at uh, DroidCon, DroidCon New York about it. And so we started experimenting with it. And um, yeah, I have been using that as well. And that, that brings some nice benefits as well, is that you can do kind of UI type tests that don't have to run on a physical device. Um, you know, it's a, it's a unit test, basically. So it runs on the command line. It runs really quickly. It, it generates a screenshot. And then it, it compares them every time. and produces a nice kind of overlay that shows you the differences if, if there are any. So we're, we're starting to experiment with that as well. Um, not clear yet on how or where we're going to use it kind of more broadly uh, during the company, but it has uh, paired nicely with with um, testing um, composable UIs for sure. So um, is that kind of what you were thinking, Zach? Yeah, basically just because, you know, these UIs just take in a single state object and uh, everything kind of like flows from there, then uh, it makes standing up new tests like this, or even just compose previews, um, like dead simple, because you just like, and these state objects are usually like value classes. And so we just, you know, hard code in whatever data you want just for your test or your snapshot. And like, it all just kind of shows up nicely. Um, yeah, there's nothing stopping people from writing things like this before too, but because circuit like very opinionatedly says like, this is how to pass in state for showing your UI. Um, it sort of like ends up being good guardrail that people write really uh, easily testable entry points like this. Just for my own uh, understanding here, when you say value classes, you most likely mean like immutable data classes, I assume. Right, yeah, not like value inline classes, yeah. Just just making sure because again, yay, terminology, uh, inline <laughs> classes, value classes, uh, immutable data classes, everything gets conflated. Everyone means something. Yeah, conflated <laughs> is actually another JetBrains uh, popular term that I don't know what it means in uh, coroutines at this point, but yeah. Sorry, which term? Conflated. Oh, conflated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> conflated broadcast yeah. channel. Uh, like, I, there's a lot of syllables in that. Yeah. We, we just, at, at some point, you know, we, we just make up some kind of reasoning for it. And then, you know, it it it, it eventually gets the right little space in, in the brain. We, we get it. Uh, I, I think we just, I just, I think we just need to combine all terms into one. Yes. The, okay. Did you see what I just did there, Seb? No, conflate. 
Oh, Conflate okay. means combine. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm sorry. You're you're clearly too clever. <laughs> My mama always told me that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I I just wanna. So we're we're slowly running out of time here. But I I do I am always curious about looking a little bit under the hood. So I just wanted to super briefly get a, a teeny tiny bit of understanding about how you built this library because so like compose is notoriously a, a compiler plugin right compiler plugins have their own little story with the with the apis not being stable and all of that i did look into the um into the circuit like getting started guide which does not require me to add anything to my gradle plugins which makes me feel like this one might not be a compiler plugin um so how kind of like is this built like on top of compose alongside it like what's the best way of thinking about this from the from the user's perspective maybe yeah the um the library like the core parts of it itself are built on top of just regular compose um and kotlin obviously um there are parts of it that have sort of like dependencies on uh obviously like Android API specifically, you know, the like circuit retained uh, stuff um, and some things that we do in our back stack to make it savable. Um, assume that you have an implementation of savable. Uh, so like Compose multi-platform doesn't implement this anywhere else. Um, but beyond that, um, yeah, we wanted to make it sort of as easy as possible to like get up and running. And we also kind of for our own Sanity like didn't want to have to maintain things that sort of already exist in the ecosystem. So like, um, yeah, I don't know. Like we didn't, we didn't. The less we have to maintain, the easier it is for us. And um, the only time you would ever need to like even add a, I don't know, like I guess a Gradle plugin um, would be if you wanted to use. We have like an optional code gen artifact that sort of streamlines. Um, uh, sort of creation of presenters um, and UIs that um, if you're using Anvil and Dagger in your code base, plays really well with that. Um, that pattern, you could people could easily write their own code generators to uh, cover you know their own use cases, but like that is a pretty like simple one, and that you know takes the KSP Gradle plugin. Um, but beyond that, it's um, yeah. It, it is more or less mostly just a runtime library, um, unless you're using that. So uh, when you go to the GitHub page, you see the under construction. I am I, I see the two little icons. I, I am missing the person with the animated shovel. I don't know if you remember back in the 90s. We can add that. To the websites, right? <laughs> uh, <Geocities>. Yeah, Geocities, <laughs> exactly. Uh, how, like, what, what do you expect from folks? Do you do you want folks outside of Slack to start using this and giving you feedback? Is it safe to use? Is it recommended to use for production? What's the state? I think we're open to to feedback and and submissions. Eh, team? Um, we'd love for people to use it. We'd love to get some feedback. Um, we're using it as Slack, so we think that means it's safe for everyone else to use. Um, there probably are. I mean, there are going to be gaps, so please let us know. And if you feel inclined, please contribute to plug those gaps, I guess. Yeah, the the biggest uh, reason for the like, you know, non stable API version is because the APIs, we we still probably want to change some of them. Um, there's some parts that we haven't implemented yet either, um, particularly around like doing like transitions between screens, um, cases that we kind of just want to wait for a team that needs it. Uh, to work with us on building it out rather than trying to like guess. Sorry, I'm also letting the dog out here because he keeps clawing at the door. Um, yeah, uh, we would love feedback from uh, the community. Um, yeah, um, please open an issue or discussion first before implementing major new features. Um, definitely better to talk with us first. Um, we've had some contributions already, right, Zach and Kieran? Yeah, yeah we've had a couple. Yeah. yeah. Nice. And it, and is there a way for someone that, that is not too familiar with it to kind of get started? Because I, I, you mentioned earlier that you have uh, some internal tools that are generators. And I was wondering, like, do you actually have like generators that generate templates for this type of 
uh, architecture or or not or it's not really needed i think it's not really needed like once you have the dependencies like added to your build file you can kind of like take off running with it um for like the initial integration that we did into slack um because we already had some sort of like foundational uh like, i don't i'm this, this is like a word soup of tech terms, a foundational platform of um, of places where people can like start building with Compose already. We did some sort of like initial, um, I don't know, infrastructure there basically to uh, have Circuit available in all the places that we already had Compose available. Um, so if you're like introducing it to your app or project that way, like. There's a tiny bit of upfront work, um, but we've actually like made that simpler than uh, when we initially did it. So it should be pretty simple. Like the biggest thing is just there's this circuit config object um, that apparently looks like this. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that a standard length or? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and it's like you need an instance of that because that's where circuit sort of drives everything from. Um, if you used Mashi or Retrofit, it's kind of similar to the Mashi and Retrofit instances where like that's what holds on to all your factories. That's what has things like unavailable content. So if you try to navigate to a screen that it doesn't have any matching UI and presenter for, it just shows a very ugly uh, text box that says, you know, couldn't find anything. Um, and from there, you can then like that needs to be provided as a composition local and then you're off to the races. Um, the two primary entry points are really simple. Um, there is circuit content, which is just a composable function that takes a screen. Um, and that, you know, shows the corresponding UI and under the hood will, you know, call the relevant factories to um, get your presenter, get your UI, and then uh, link them for you under the hood. Um, we, for uh, navigable contexts, uh, we have a navigable circuit content uh, that takes in a uh, backstack and navigator so that uh, they can, you know, push and pop screens uh, to uh, traverse your app. Um, and that's sort of it for the entry points. Like, it's it's been really nice that it's been that simple. Um, it's been maybe a little bit too limiting in some ways. We're, like, we're still trying to figure out some better patterns for, like, uh, sharing common UI state. Uh, for example, um, when we talk with other folks in the community, um, the only solutions for this are things like composite presenters um, and doing like uh, state tunneling that it works, but it's not our favorite. Um, but yeah, uh, to go, I guess, all the way back to your initial question, um, it's hopefully very easy to pick it up and start tinkering with it. Um, the biggest thing is just having that circuit config instance. It is a lot easier to use if you're using something like Anvil uh, and Dagger and doing like multi bindings to get all of your uh, factories um, automatically hoisted up into your circuit config instance. Um, we did kind of build this more or less um, with the assumption that like you're using a DI framework of some sort. Um, you can you can go without it, and for very simple screens, uh, that's obviously fine. Um, but if you're trying to scale it, you know, horizontally across like a large app, um, you're going to want DI. For folks who don't, who are completely unfamiliar with it, I just want to check it out. We have a sample app in the Circuit repo um, where it, it's it's cute. It's a, like a just a simple pet adoption app. It um, it uses the um, the data from like a from the foster place that Zach uh, goes to, um, and it has examples of uh, it has like a bottom nav bar. Um, it has like uh, ca cards. Uh, the UI is like cards, so that you could kind of. It's pretty like it. I would say involved circ uh, involved compose, but like it's a good example of compose UI, uh, and it's it's multi screen. Um, and then we have another, I believe, interop example in, in our repo as well, but with a, like a very simple counter, just a counter presenter counter UI. But I think in terms of like looking at, yeah, looking at code or l looking at circuit in a non, you know, huge app like Slack, like using the, the dog adoption app or the counter app, that's kind of a good way also to get, to get started. Yeah, we have a bunch of 
uh, examples. So there's like multi-platform ones. There's uh, um, some like interop for like what would it look like to interop from like RX or coroutines or something. So um, yeah, we needed these docs for our own like you know colleagues internally, and like there was no reason that we couldn't have most of that be public. So yeah, hopefully a lot of prior art you can look at. There are also tests for for those sample apps, so you can um, go see how we kind of think testing should be done as well. So, oh, nice. So you get like a, a complete, like sl slightly opinionated overview of of circuit, uh, which is probably the best way for for people um, who are at home listening in uh, to maybe get started with this at whatever weekend this episode comes out before <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i mean honestly you had me at the pitch where where you said there was a sub team it's like that thought it was fun to use when someone says it's fun to use i'm like all right i'll i'll give it a shot <laughs> yeah if nothing else the sample app uh has lots of cute uh dog pictures so yeah well now there's a yeah now now there's a definitive reason uh to, <laughs> at, to at least check that one out give it a star and so on Holly's looking <laughs> skeptical. no i just I, I just had an idea i i think we should do a we should do a we should do an episode on dependency injection i know that some folks are um like yeah i think that'll be an interesting episode we should do that you just want to no. put a couple of people in a cage and film it or like, what <laughs> 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 Like if four Pretty people much, enter, yeah, one person fun. leaves, <laughs> and that's how we're gonna do dependency Stanker. management till the rest of the yeah. time. You gonna arm yeah. them with daggers, or yeah. <laughs> we should do something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, take a note, Seb. Let's do that. Let's do that. It'll be interesting because I mean, when when you uh, mentioned it, um, Zach, uh, that you know, we assume the majority of folks use a DI framework. I was kind of thinking about all the holy wars going on around uh ioc containers and dependency injection so yeah the great but yeah is one that works for you so yeah i was gonna say the new keyword but there isn't one in Kotlin. <laughs> right okay anyway we gotta wrap this up uh it's been great it's been long it's been good uh so thank you all for uh joining us and uh congratulations on circuit and uh Let's hope it breaks. No. no. <laughs> what? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was just trying to play the whole circuit breaker thing, but it just oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> there we go. Thanks for yeah. the the ringing endorsement, Hadi. Yeah. 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 Let's hope it breaks. Yeah, there we go. There you go. How do you know you can build a, a fuzzy logic uh, like library called Circuit Breaker that, that like, tries <laughs> yeah. to... Yeah, oh, actually, we could create a new... D oh, there you go. Sorry, we could, uh, let's retake. Congratulations on Circuit and let's create a new DI framework that goes with it that's called Circuit Breaker. Yeah. Hey, very so good. System dot exit as soon as you use it. <laughs> 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 All right. Amrita, uh, Kiers, um, and uh, Zach, thank you so much for, for coming on today. It was really nice having you. Um, very much appreciated. I always love learning about these kind of new things, and I'm sure a lot of people at home did uh, as well. If you are one of the people who have tuned in in audio only, then of course you don't know how long uh, Zach thinks a circuit is. So make sure you also <laughs> check out. <laughs> so make sure you also check out the video recording uh, on YouTube.com/slash Kotlin. And if you're already tuned in and not subscribed, then you you already know the whole shebang. You are one of the few people who has made it to the end of the episode. Uh, so yeah, thanks thanks for for staying with us until the end. Cool. And hopefully, we're going to see all of you uh, in the next episode. I have no idea what it's going to be about, so you're going to be as, uh, like, suspenseful as I am. <laughs> all right. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.